Hold on. I'm recording as well. So right. I'll go through the policy reading like any okay. other time. Hold on. Uh, okay. Uh, just a second, guys. Linux Foundation meetings involve participation by industry competitors, and it is the intention of the Linux Foundation to conduct all of its activities in accordance with applicable antitrust and competition laws. It is therefore extremely important that these adhere to meeting agendas and be aware of and not participate in any activities that are prohibited under applicable US state, federal, or foreign antitrust and competition laws. Examples of types of actions that are prohibited at Linux Foundation meetings and in connection with Linux Foundation activities are described in the Linux Foundation Antitrust Policy. If you have questions about those matters, please contact your company counsel. Or if you are a member of the Linux Foundation, feel free to contact Andrew Abdegrove of the Linux, uh, sorry, of the firm of Gasmere Abdegrove LLP, which provides legal counsel to the Linux Foundation. I pledge is committed to creating a safe and welcoming community for all. For more information, please visit our hyperledger code of conduct. So, welcome everybody to this meeting. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you all to Bob Haverstein. He's from the Netherlands. And, uh, you know, he will give this meeting uh, a focus on what's going not only on terms of trade funds, but also on trade in more general terms. Uh, focusing on what's going on in the Netherlands and Northern Europe. So I would, uh, I would leave it on to Bob to, to tell us about, you know, what he's doing and what uh, his projects are. Bob. Yeah. Let me uh, attempt to share my screen. Yeah, please do. I hope you see it now. Yeah, perfectly. And hopefully you see the full slides. So yeah, uh, hello, welcome. Uh, we're here all together because we're interested somehow in, in trade, trade finance uh, and DLT, blockchain. Uh, I will mutually interfere, interchange the words DLT and blockchain. So I'm sorry for the purists, uh, but I'm going to do that. Um, so yeah, global trade, trade finance and logistics. Trade finance is very much depending on all kinds of triggers from the logistics, so they're really intertwined. So I would like to, uh, to have a little bit of a look at that today. So if you look at the challenges um, we currently face is that there's always a lack of trust in the whole supply chain. It's disconnected, non-standardized, and unfortunately it's very much paper-based and it has a huge impact, not only on the logistics, but as well as uh, the whole supply chain and therefore also uh, the services financial institutions provide with the help of trade finance. So if you look at it, then blockchain is basically a way to solve a lot of these worldwide supply chain problems. Uh, but for all of the companies that are involved in the whole supply chain, they have different value drivers. It could be that I would like to have more control about ownership, compliance. They want to know more about where their goods are, so they were more interested in track and tracing. Or maybe they want to be able to share the data on a much easier way. Well, blockchain can provide there, of course, a solution to that because it can build trust, it can enhance the transparency, it supports the paperless trade. Uh, therefore, also it can reduce costs, but at the same time, it creates all kinds of new opportunities and especially financing, to fair, especially the smaller companies. So we in the financial industry, uh, we are very much aware of this and there are many uh, collaborations already going on uh, using this technology. But also within uh, logistics, they see the, the benefits of this very much. So some uh, quotes from the past, from instance, from the, uh, the founder and chairman of FedEx, that they really believe that blockchain will have a huge impact on the supply chain, transportation, and logistics. And that's also being mentioned by the CEO of Mellon Musk. Digitization will help, and also blockchain, in this case, will help. And of course, we know all about their collaboration with IBM uh, together uh, in the initiative called TradeLens. So it's all about collaboration. But what you see uh, in the whole supply chain, um, even if there are the best intentions, um, 
there is a problem most of the times there is a an incentive to do collaboration but at the same time um, not everybody wants to share their knowledge very well they have opportunistic behavior in that case most of the time there is also a lack of commitment and the relationships are not always that stable so you have this instability and we have to also understand that this actually is still a business model to not collaborate so we have a lot of problems we actually are facing technology can help but it's also in the mindset of the people all along in the supply chain to really make this happening we need to be able to collaborate so if you want to understand a little bit more about trade and the financing of trade one of the best things actually is to follow the trade flows where are all your goods going where are the vessels so you see if you look at any moment in time uh, for instance you can go to ship tracker uh, you can follow all the types of vessels the container ships the uh, oil vessels uh, you name it and you see there is a huge amount of yeah goods being shipped over about 80 percent of all global trade is actually seaborne so that has a huge impact on all the supply chains and you can imagine uh, one little uh, problem in this whole supply chain uh, is that, like the effect of a grain of salt in your machinery and we recently actually saw an, uh, an example of this the sewage blockage um, and that has a huge impact on all the supply chains but also economically there's a huge impact well we saw a lot of vessels lying and waiting to be able to pass the sewage canal uh, now it has been freed and all the ships are on the way so now we are actually on the way to maybe a next blockage point which are normally the ports um, and with that afterwards you have the whole supply chain after the ports you have all the hinterland transportation so there's a huge impact on all uh, the blocks going forward so i would like now as andrea already mentioned to focus a little bit more on a certain region in northern europe um, which is a world city about 30 million inhabitants um, it's european innovation hotspot the capital of europe is there brussels uh, it's a european gateway with three airports and three seaports uh, about eight universities are in the world of the top 100 and if you've enlarge that to 150 there's actually 15 universities involved in that so there's a lot of knowledge a lot of innovation happening and together with um, uh, the gateways we have uh, our airports and the seaports there's a lot of innovation happening there as well so now just assume that we do a simple customer journey we are actually a vessel and we're now on our way to the port and we enter the port so what we would like to see is like have this situation. There's free passage. There's a cave, all free for us. The cranes waiting to lift our containers. But yeah, before we uh, are able to do so, we have to understand that we're actually part of an ecosystem, a quite complicated ecosystem. We have to deal with the port authorities and the operators. We have to deal with the terminals. We have to deal with customs. As a shipping line, we're part of that ecosystem in this case. We have our cargo for our cargo owners. And if it that, we also have the logistic companies, uh, which are providing all the service to the hinterland. It can be by truck, by rail, or by barge. So before we actually enter the port, we have to find, OK, are we allowed to get into the port? Is the place for us at the K? Is there a towing boat to help us to, to actually berth to the K? Then is the terminal actually available for us to lift our containers? Um, to bunker actually to gas us up maybe we need other provisions food um, we have to get loaded again and with that we have all this paperwork involved also well ports i really understood that and uh, as an example i gave the port of rotterdam but it's the same for uh, the port of antwerp they understand that they have to focus more on digitization to be able to automate so there are different stages if you focus how uh, the port of Rotterdam is looking at this. In the beginning, there's no automation and you have all kinds of different steps. First, you do some automation uh, for waste of the port authority. So great, they have an integrated system for themselves, but then they want to have the whole port community, the ecosystem involved. So then they have a nice port community system. They also want to integrate the hinterland with that. So there's more easy combination and uh, communication with the help of all the logistics providers, as well as the cargo owners. And in the end, of course, you don't want to see this as a simple entity 
on its own, you want to be connected to all the ports or at least the logistics hubs all over the world. So you have a very connected system. So with that, you can create basically a complete digital twin. Not only a digital twin that you have sensors in the K that you, you understand what is the condition of my K, but also that you can follow all the goods over your digital environment, which is basically the port system, as well as your hinterland. And if it's all connected, you can do it all globally. So with that, you can understand exactly when a ship is coming in and provide all the communications and prepare all the next steps in the line to be actually ready, to be as efficient as possible. Because that is one of the things the Port of Rotterdam is focusing a lot on. They want to be the gateway of Europe. Therefore, operational excellence is very important. And you can only do that if you're fast, efficient, and of course, you have to provide reliable, safe, and sustainable services. So there's a really smooth end-to-end -end flow. Well, they have all kinds of services that relate to that, uh, digital services that you can look what is the estimated time of arrival, that you can uh, order all kinds of bunkerage. If um, you need extra con uh, connections with rail, you can all see that. Uh, and at the same time, um, all kinds of service related to navigation. What is the best way in order to get to the port when I do have the least uh, CO2 emissions involved? If I need an extra empty container, where do I get that? Do it, where is the most efficient way? Because theoretically, an empty container should be shipped back to the port. But maybe there is already an empty container next to you. Your neighbor has it lying around when you're actually based in France. So you can actually take advantage of that. So they create all kinds of services, digital services, to make the whole journey for me as a cargo owner in this case, very efficient. And all the participants as well, to be less paper-based, more digital, and provide all kinds of services to make this whole journey very smooth and efficient. Because they have their area, the case, but they don't want to be a storage. They want to make sure that when the ship comes, the container hits, actually lands, that it's as quickly as possible moved to its hinterland. And if you want to provide uh, shipping services, that the container comes into the port as shortly as possible before the vessel arrives and then being uh, taken out from the port again. So you can assume that in the future, actually based on uh, the willingness of how much you want to pay and how much you're in a hurry, you can actually maybe bring a container only a few hours before a ship really uh, sails, that the vessel comes to the location and being put on the ship and therefore uh, being also having the chance to be unloaded as quickly as possible as well. So with that, you have more efficiency. So one of the things which are, uh, this is all possible just with APIs in principle, um, but in the case of container release, there have been uh, already a solution based on blockchain. They started with uh, MSC and T mining in the port of Antwerp, and is also now present in the port of Rotterdam. Uh, container release is based first traditionally that a paper has been moved on, and if you have that paper, you can pick up the container. Well, they started to digitize this in a, with the help of a pin code uh, around 10 years ago. So a pin code is attached to a container. If you want to pick it up from the location, you get this pin code and you can pick it up. And you see like, if I'm the cargo owner, I get the pickup, I use maybe a logistics partner, I send it over to a pin code to somebody else. Maybe they use another trucking company uh, that get that pin code. So this is something which is easily copyable. And if you have actually this pin code, you can just go and claim that container. So a lot of possibilities of fraud. So with the help of blockchain, you can actually tokenize this right to pick up a container. And if you move it actually towards another party, which is this right to pick it up, you can transfer the ownership. So this is one of the examples where blockchain DLT can provide a huge opportunity. Next to that, before you actually can pick up a container, you have to uh, be, uh, a few conditions have to be met. First of all, the container has to be there and has to be released by the terminal. Also the customs have to say, this, actually this container, this cargo is cleared. And next to that, uh, it has to be sure that there has been paid for. So also a payment trigger from the bank is important. Well, if you have APIs, this information can be automated in a smart contract 
If it's been done, then the ownership can be moved on to the target, uh, to the cargo owner. So this is an example where you can create trust with the blockchain, as well as make sure that there's an efficient process going on with the help of this new technology. Well, once I pick up this container again, um, I'm back most of the time back to paper. And especially with uh, cargo on a truck, a lot of it is still done in consignment mode. You have a nice name for that, CMR. It's a nice long French word for it, which I always forget. But it's basically a, a document which is passed on from the shipper, which is basically uh, the instruction to a carrier, which then move it to the end location. And it has to be signed off. And with that, you actually can also do the invoicing uh, for the shipment itself. Well, uh, Transfollow, uh, a company in the Netherlands, has been also digitizing this. And then with the help of a digital form, which can be plated already with information, which is already way before this step, you can automate it and, uh, and populate it. You just have to check it. Uh, with that, um, you have it on your, uh, your mobile. Uh, you can plan it automatically much better. Um, the handover is done on QR codes. You don't need a wet signature, but if you want, you can still sign on the screen as well. So it's a much more efficient way of dealing with it. And with that, it creates also an, a separate ecosystem in itself. If a carrier um, needs to pick up with a, sh a shipper, it has been announced in advance, so you can schedule it much better. You can actually automate it then. Uh, when it's been picked up and the carrier is on the way and has a delay, the time of arrival at the end destination will be changed. Actually, through this uh, network, it can also communicate that. So if you're awaiting a special delivery and all the logistics in the warehouse has to be arranged for that, you can also adjust that immediately on a real-time basis. Um, if something happens on the road, an accident, and one of the carriers is involved in it, um, before the fire department is there, it can also check uh, which trucks are involved in it and is there a dangerous goods involved? If yes, what is then the loading? So it can be a whole new ecosystem where a lot of people uh, involved in different ways, which you cannot even uh, envision in the beginning, they can share uh, on a safe way information again, which is basically being done also with the help of blockchain to make the whole supply chain visible. Well, if I leave the harbor, there's another interesting thing going on that nowadays we have cameras and that can actually check for many different ways. It can check if this container is leaving, leaving the property. So it gives you an extra trigger. Hey, it's really being picked up and my cargo is on its way. But it can also check if there is a damage on the container as well. If there is damage, you know, may, maybe there is also damage on your goods. And maybe you know that this container cannot be used in the future anymore. So it gives another opportunity to censor what is really going on. Well, collaborative transformation is really what we need. We need to collaborate as I mentioned before. So the recap, what is now really the problem? We have limited transparency, which creates basically risks, disruptions, and a lot of waste, in this case, costs. So what we can do is adopt a new infrastructure to make this whole new international trade more digital. Create an ecosystem. But if you now look at the ecosystem, it's kind of scattered. We have all kinds of different pieces of the puzzle all differently. We have uh, you know, solutions with, based on participants. It can be only in logistics, only in trade finance. It can be on geography, only in Europe or something, only in Africa or only in Asia. Then it has different business value use cases, but it can also be different technology or networks. It can be still a cloud solution. It can be an on-premises uh, solution as well, a traditional database, or it can be something based on DLT blockchain technology. And it would be great if we can make this all inclusive and there blockchain can provide this means again, that it's basically creating the rail to interconnect all of this not just the APIs, because you have a lot of possibilities there as well already, but with the blockchain technology, you can provide there the extra layer of trust. that can really say like, this is an event which happened at this time and everybody can verify it, which is then very beneficial for the whole supply chain. So with that, basically blockchain enables this inclusive ecosystem, depending if you're 
a user, an insurance, a bank, a financial institution, or a logistics supplier, or on the other hand, the importer, the exporter, the regulator, you use some kind of um, solution already, which is out there. That can be a single window, can be a logistics platform, provenance, or something related to finance. All of this makes it all interactive with each other. So it doesn't matter which solution you use. In principle, you could use all the information and make it transparent for the whole supply chain. But you already know that, of course. But the digital twin is the thing. Now we're all different entities with all different solutions. And it would be great if we could create this one single view of this. So if you look at the digital twin, as an example, you have here a, a, a normal trade from a seller to a buyer. And if you, this case, look, for instance, from the income term SIF, cost insurance and freight, uh, there are many things you can think about here. If we are actually uh, the seller, we can have all our documentation ready. Uh, we have a check where is the origin, but also the quality and the quantity of the goods. It has been in a container. We close it, there's a sensor on the outside. So we know exactly when the door is being opened, yes or no. There's information about the, uh, the location of the, the container itself, as well as the conditions within, and we ship it. Well, while we're shipping it, all that information can already be shared with the party which is receiving it, as well as the destination port. So in advance, you can already do all the customs clearance. The information is there. Uh, in theory, the customers don't have to open and check the container anymore and the goods because it has been checked in advance, theoretically. So there can be a huge efficiency and uh, time uh, part as well as costs. At the same time, that means that I, as a cargo owner, can pick it up much easier and much quicker. And all of the transportation to me and my warehouse can be already planned in advance. And if I get updates when a ship is being delayed, I can actually adjust that. The same as when a truck or a barge or a train at a later stage. But also if I think about financing, um, in this case, think about the documentary uh, pro instrument, uh, the in, uh, documentary credits, uh, paperwork has to be sent over to the other side. Uh, and before I can get hold of it, I need to pay before. This is only because I want to be more in control of my goods and be sure of my payments. Well, if uh, the ownership of the container is being stored in blockchain, we know there is an owner there, uh, together with the information of the location of the uh, container, I know exactly when it arrives at the destination port, when it's offloaded and hitting the key, when it's actually passing customs, and when it's being picked up. All these can be triggers to give me the notification, okay, I have been fulfilling my requirements for delivering the goods and this can trigger automatically already a payment. And based on that payment, I can already be paid before by my bank because they can also see the information and uh, judge what is the performance risk of me getting and delivering it at the end, as well as the payment risk at the end if I want to have my payment. So there are a lot of automation uh, possibilities over there. So in the end, blockchain enables us then to create this inclusive ecosystem, create this digital twin, and think about all kinds of innovative services. Well, you talk about this already a lot in the Hyperledger group, and you can contact me afterwards. But if you want to understand a little bit more about logistics, which is basically, yeah, I think if you want to understand uh, your client and the service you want to provide to them, in this case, trade finance, you have to understand the business of your client very well, as well as the problems they are, uh, they are facing. And therefore, it's very interesting to find out what is happening in logistics. Um, but there are some nice uh, movies which I share with you. Uh, one of them uh, is about the Netherlands and logistics, especially related to the port. Um, we are very famous for our flowers, but most of the flowers actually come from all over the world before we ship it over to the world again. So you can follow it as well. And um, some of you might know, but I think most of you don't know, we're one of the second largest exporter of vegetables. 
So we actually produce a lot, but also export a lot as well as import it. But this is very nice to have that visible also. They have been creating all kinds of nice data visualizations on that. Uh, and with that, I want to uh, thank you for your attention. And I'm very interested in a, a nice discussion with you right now. Thanks, Bob. It was indeed a very interesting presentation. I thank you very much for this. Uh, I'll leave it on to the audience. You know, I have my own thoughts, I have my own questions, but I've leave it on to the attendance to make some questions to Bob. It's an occasion. This, this this meeting is a little different compared to the others because it's mainly focused on the logistic side of trade and trade funds, of course. Andrea. I mean. Yes. Hi, it's Eugenio. And uh, hi, Bob. And hi. Uh, thank you for the, for the presentation. I actually have uh, a comment or anyway, a suggestion to share with all of the audience here. I think, uh, I mean, the, the presentation got exactly one point that I loved particularly, and it was related on, 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 on stressing the point on how it's it is difficult for now to build a business case scenario, a strong business case scenario that can support the, in the later stage of commercial, um, commercialization of uh, one solution. And um, of course, blockchain is a sports team. And so, as you correctly said, uh, different players with different access to the network, with different capabilities to implement the network um is required uh but at the same time i would ask you bob if you uh can have maybe coming from your past experience uh, if you want to share some uh some details about the process which helped you to build uh several business case scenario from financial perspective but also from an operational perspective i think this will be very interesting for me and Thank you. Okay, well, to come to that, um, as a financial institution, um, we're left out of most of the information. Uh, we're only part of a very small part of the whole process. And most of it currently is still uh, paper-based. So if we get more information out of logistics, we can actually have more triggers of what is happening in the whole performance of delivering something. With that, you can uh, have more data and do risk mitigation measures much more and adjust models. Because currently, if you look at the, the risk, it's basically a huge block for us right now, which is always the same. Of course, we mm -hmm. don't know what's happening until something is finished. If you get more uh, information, it's all kinds of small steps towards the delivery. And with that, at the end, you only know then you have a, a payment issue mm -hmm. if you want. Uh, that so with that you can have risk mitigation already uh, with that if you have more information that means as a financial institution you can do a lot more automation because now uh, a lot of the products uh, the instruments we use for financing are still based on paper if you have more of the information in a digital form you can perform much easier and much quicker your processes and with that you can basically turn down your costs and with that, mm -hmm. hopefully also provide much easier and cheaper new financing instruments to your clients. So these are basically all kinds of ingredients you can use in order to create a business case. But a lot of it is yeah, still unknown, a lot of wet finger work <laughs> and, and assumptions, but you have to monitor this. You have to do some small experiments and yeah, see how you can measure and if it has a benefit. And then later on, uh, create a much larger uh, investment in this and really put it into production, so to say. Mm. You have to start with small steps and to understand yeah. what is possible. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. So I think the, the key steps are having more information, automation of the operation and cost saving reduction. So yeah. these are the, the, the main process of uh, building the business case, the for at least the first business case. Okay, and thank you. Yeah, and, and I believe on top of that, I believe also that you, you have to do this in collaboration, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. And what you see is like there's a lot of collaboration with the same participants. You know, banks are doing a lot with banks, uh, so to say. 
But I think it's much nicer to understand what is really happening in your ecosystem, in your value chain, by picking out other participants. When I was working on a project called Deliver, I was doing it together with the Port of Rotterdam, Samsung SDS, which is the logistics as well as the IT department of Samsung, and a financial institution, in this case, AB and AMRO. So we have all kinds of different perspectives. Uh, we're not competitors of each other and therefore get a much better understanding of what's happening and what is required to be able to serve the whole ecosystem. So also, mm -hmm. yeah, cross industries, I think is a, a multidisciplinary in this case is very important. Okay, I understand, sure, and I agree. Thank you. I was, uh, sorry Bob, there was Fanny Montgomery, he raised his hands, maybe he wants to make questions to Fanny. You still there? Ah, yes, I'm still here. Thank you. Very interesting webinar. Well, uh, actually, I'm uh, more interested in the uh, application and the real case scenario. But uh, uh, Junior already asked that. So if we, it will be great if there is more uh, real life scenario or application with uh, related with what uh, with the presentation provided before. Thank you. Uh, you do see this already happening um, if we're in the ports ecosystem itself. Another example I mentioned is straight lines, which is helping uh, a lot of automation with the help of the shipping lines and also all kinds of extra shares on top of that. And they're looking more and more into the finance. Uh, we have uh, in the financial world a lot of initiatives based on blockchain, which are looking also for linkage with the logistics because they're, you know, the like what I mentioned, a lot of the information is required uh, to optimize the processes. Because if you think about it, a lot of the events in the logistics part relating to documents, which are then used for the financing. So basically, it's much more interesting to find immediately the event itself and to get the information about it than the document which is representing the event. For instance, shipping, we have the bill of lading. There's a lot of initiatives in digitizing this, but it's basically yeah, the shipment itself. In this case, it's also the title of ownership, but you have a lot of these things happening as well. An invoice is because you have provided a service. So what is the service then? And can you actually prove that you did this service? And with that, for instance, factoring becomes then also much easier. You don't only get the invoice, how much they need to be paid, but what has been done for that service, and you can actually check that. Okay, nice. okay, thank you. Really interesting. Yeah. Uh, Niels, I see you raised your hands. Uh, yes. First of all, welcome. This is the first meeting. I'm glad to see you here. Yeah, yeah, it is. And uh, it's quite a nice, uh, nice initiation. Uh, it was very, very good, uh, good, uh, good presentation. So thanks a lot, Bob. Um, yeah, I, I like the, the kind of scenario you sketched out about all the kind of the data sharing. Um, and I, I, uh, I, I believe that if you, yeah, if you manage to, to make, you know, more data, more accessible, it's kind of like a positive feedback loop of everybody sharing and everybody, uh, uh, yeah, giving back and creating more data. Um, one thing that I'm, I mean, I personally, I don't have a lot of experience with the, with trade lens itself. Like, I'm not really sure what, what it looks like exactly. Um, I was just wondering if there are any barriers to kind of signing up. Um, and how does it actually improve, you know, the, the whole process? Uh, I'm not a specialist in trade lines, unfortunately. Uh, I don't know much. Um, it's mainly uh, focusing currently on the, the logistics and from the shipping uh, lines, providing it. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you as a cargo owner, you're using the shipping lines. And with that, you should see more information and uh, data sharing within the role environment. I know they're also looking into all kinds of financing propositions over there. So I advise you just uh, at least look at their website and there are some contact uh, details there. Uh, so you can reach out to them. Um, what they did is basically, yeah, make the whole flow of all the steps which are in a logistics uh, uh, journey uh, possible. They make that possible. Uh, for instance, if a container has been uh, offloaded and it's on a truck afterwards, it also has to be checked for kinds of gases, etc. All those things, uh, the weighing of the container, all those things are steps in the whole logistics plane uh, stage, and they make that visible and, okay. and possible to automate it. Okay. And with that, all the documents which are related to those events, 
to be able to be shared easier. Okay, yeah, that's uh, that's interesting because uh, I mean the reason that I that I asked this is because I mean personally I wrote a I wrote an article on uh, on blockchain bills of lading, um, and uh, one kind of main issue with uh, with kind of creating a big enough network that it actually made a difference to digitize you know the bill of lading was the difficulty of signing in or signing up to you know a registry system. Um, so I'm, I mean, the first, I think the first, uh, first step, at least with the bill of lading, which is, you know, a big part of the, of the whole process, yeah, should be to make this uh, as low barrier to entry as, as possible. Um, so I guess at some point, maybe trade lens or other, other uh, companies or organizations will make this, uh, this possible. I know there's a couple, a couple who are actually doing it right now. Um, Cargo X is uh, somebody who I think, uh, so I wrote my article on, on Ethereum build lading and uh, then I then I looked it up and, and Cargo X is actually a company which which is doing that. So maybe also an interesting thing. Other examples are Bolero, S Dogs, uh, you have Wave. Uh, they're all uh, yeah, part of this creating a digital version of the bill of lading and they create their own uh, ecosystem with their own special rules currently because uh, there is no uh, central law which everybody obeys yeah. within the whole world. Yeah. Uh, to accept this unfortunately but no, no. there are a lot of initiative working on this and um there's a lot of progress thank god yeah but we're not there yet yeah no my article was uh was focusing on the uh, model law and electronic transferable records so exactly that that kind of law so i think first first step would be for or one of the big steps would be for countries to adopt this into their into their uh, local law and then make all these all these things possible because without legal certainty there's you know, there's not going to be a lot of process. No, and then we need uh, the support from the ICC, WTO, uh, and you name it. Yes, thanks. Thanks, Niels. Uh, thanks for the insights and thanks for the answers. Uh, I have my own question, Bob, if you allow me to. Uh, we're talking about, you know, ports, ports for arrival, ports for departure. Uh, there are, of course, different actors involved in the whole chain. Uh, with different technology levels. Uh, if you think, you know, this is, a, to me, this is a major bottleneck in the whole, whole picture. Uh, how do you see in perspective in the next years, how do you think this can be solved? I mean, from a technological point of view, of course, rough then is some kind of uh, the excellence in the picture. There are, of course, some other ports connected to that do not reach the same level. What do you think can be done in the future to solve this problem, which can be a problem in achieving full automatization out there of the process, shipping and trading, trade finance as well, in all this connected? I think we all have to understand what are the benefits, and we have to promote what are the benefits of digitization. Um, a lot of Participants in the whole supply chain uh, do understand what are the possibilities there. Uh, COVID also uh, made it very clear. Unfortunately, then you also see that only the larger companies having the means in order to make this step. Uh, I gave the example of the consignment nodes uh, of Transfollo, the ECMR. A lot of the trucking companies do understand what are the possibilities and the benefits of this but they already have a very low margin. They have currently difficulty to find cargo. They're fighting for it. Uh, Brexit doesn't help for instance as well. Uh, so they don't have the means to make this transformation. So they need some extra cash. Financial institutions, unfortunately, they look at what is the credit pressure related to this company. They currently are not doing well on the balance sheet and therefore they, we don't want to provide them in finance. But yeah, you have to think a little bit differently that if you really help them, to make this transition, to make it more digital, they are better able to do their performance, their services, they can drop their costs internally so they have more money available for themselves and therefore also can repay maybe uh, financing you provide them. So uh, I think from the financial institutions, you have to think a little bit more in a yeah, different mindset and help the transformation of a company. And this is just an example, for instance, a trucking company, but this is related with the ports as well and all the players in the whole supply chain. And what you also see is like a lot of services which are now de developed 
digitally for one certain port can actually be sold as a service to another port. So helping each other by providing these services helps as well as the mindset that we need to invest a little bit more and think that it has a benefit overall uh, instead of looking at the short term. You have to look a little bit more on the long term. But it's easy for me to say I'm a, <laughs> I'm a believer in this, uh, but sometimes people are uh, more looking at uh, hard facts and a short term, and then it becomes very difficult. That this is the attitude that I notice generally. You know, you see that you reason and you start arguing the, the short term and you don't think about the middle and long term. Maybe because Jamsmaps these days have already invested legacy systems, you know, and, and they have already done the investment and now to invest even more, some kind of tricky for them. Uh, I was thinking also, you know, when you were talking, uh, we're talking about data, we're talking about digitalization. Uh, there's a whole step, there's a third step in the picture, you mentioned maybe this, which is the customs process. How to involve, uh, how to involve, sorry, institutions in this picture, because they're stuck, stuck on paper. For them, paper is a picture. Uh, they do want to see uh, papers, do want to see maybe even more papers than a normal range. So how to get them convinced and persuaded, okay, let's go for data instead and step in this old frictionless, seamless procedures. Uh, that, that's understanding. I mean, that, that's brainstorming because, uh, you know, being, being in the industry for, for a long time, you see, you notice how these institutions can create problems. But not only customs clearance, I think about, you know, those institutions that has to uh, release documents, they do it still in a paper-based format. Think about certificate of origin, think about the EU one model, think about all those forms, form B, form C to China, India, that still are only on a paper-based format, nothing more than this. So we're talking about inclusive and comparative approach but are those institutions ready at present to go for full digital process? I think they're ready, but you have to um, yeah, still convince them. They understand most of the times the possibilities. They also uh, found out themselves now uh, with the help of the pandemic or the COVID-19, actually uh, that human interaction has been not so easily possible. Therefore, the paper is not the best solution either. So they do understand it and have been releasing a few of the, uh, the hard requirements. Uh, but as things are getting back to normal, they pick those up again. So if you are part of a digitization and transformation in that perspective and uh, a new solution, yeah, it's very uh, important to include them as quickly as possible. Do a small experiment with them. Let them test and experience how it is and help them to understand what are really the benefits if they really uh, uh, recognize it, they will support you. Of course, uh, they might be willing and the mindset is that, but then you still have the regulations within certain countries, uh, which is stopping them still. So you also have to help them to move forward how they can change the regulations. So that is uh, yeah, quite troublesome. Uh, it's a many step process and probably also uh, not something you can do in months. But you think, uh, unfortunately, a little bit of a longer period of time. Uh, but it's really important to get them on board as quickly as possible if you want to do something uh, related to transformation uh, and digitization in the whole supply chain and get their support. Uh, I'll leave it again to the audience, until the audience to make more questions. If you have any doubt about this, what we're talking about. Ross, any, any room up from you? I see you in the audience. Ross, you there? Uh, yeah, just, uh, uh, yes, Andrea, just one comment. There are a few countries that are picking up on the UN CITRAL um, rules and are legislating electronic bills of loading. Uh, the most recent was Singapore. I think it's up to three. But the challenges are that, you know, you need many, much more saturation of the market to adopt. 
uh, you know, fully electronic processes. And that that's an ongoing challenge. It's been running for many years and it looks like there's a few more years to go, but there is progress. And I thought I'd mention that. It, it certainly is. And I think the best way to do it is to try to make a, yeah, a green lane, a digital uh, trade lane possible, show what are really the, uh, the, the benefits and the possibilities over there. And then uh, if that's very clear and visible, all the others will follow as well. And with that, it's not only between countries because a certain trade lane is basically uh, uh, a connecting point to a whole region. So therefore more and more countries will benefit from it. Yeah, exactly. It's like success breeds success and everybody wants not to be the first, but they don't want to be the second and that's the challenge. True. <laughs> yeah, if, if I may offer a comment, this is uh, Tat Yin. Um, at the moment, as far as I know, there are six uh, container lines that uh, have their bills of lading uh, issued subject to Singapore law. And uh, it's also my understanding that, uh, you know, um, such bills of lading subject to Singapore law uh, would have, you know, would carry along uh, with, with them uh, recognition of uh, an electronic uh, bill of lading should they be issued uh, electronically. So, so I guess uh, even for shipping lines that are headquartered uh, in other parts of the world, if they wanted to have legal certainty uh, for electronic form of their bills of lading, uh, they could actually consider making their electronic bills of lading subject to Singapore law. Yeah, so, so this is just a thought that I'd like to share. It is true. I, I've, fortunately, I think there is a lot of attention currently only for the bill of lading. I think, yes, it's very important as a document itself and to flow information to make more visible. But it's something which happens only between two points in the whole supply chain. And there are so many more actors uh, which have a huge impact also on the efficiency, the cost, etc. So I think you should also focus on those things, not just on the bill of lighting. But that's a personal uh, thought. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're so right. You know, in fact, in fact, two thirds of uh, sea shipments are not issued bills of lighting. They are issued seaway bills. And uh, more than half of all seaway bills are electronic, but we don't, we don't see uh, attention being paid, you know, to, to how banks uh, might interact with electronic uh, seaway bills. Uh, the same can be said of airway bills, right? Uh, more than two thirds of airway bills today, according to IATA are electronic, but we don't see any effort, uh, you know, to work with uh, e-airway bills. And I, I don't know, I don't know what effort there is uh, to work with ECMRs in Europe. But uh, it, it is quite extensive, actually, uh, the ECMR. Right, <laughs> right. So, so um, I, I guess I guess my comment is uh, linked to to things from a financing perspective and uh, trade finance. If we believe WTO figures, you know, uh, they, they estimate that eighty to ninety percent of uh, world trade is. Uh, is trade financed, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, so when we discuss uh, digitization, uh, it's it's always uh, uh, important uh, to to think of how trade finance uh, uh, is to be done uh, uh, using uh, you know the 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 uh, benefits of uh, digitization. It's important to 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 articulate and and to create uh, you know ways. For trade financiers to be able to work uh, in in uh, in a digital fashion with with the digital uh, uh, documents or electronic records, so so I think I think uh, it it is very important uh, when when we look at uh, all these various types of electronic transport documents that uh, banks and uh, non bank financiers be engaged uh, to 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 kind of create a practice on a on, on the provision of finance using electronic versions of these documents. Otherwise, what we would see is that, you know, for, for the portions of trade which receive financing from banks, uh, those are the parts of trade where paper would continue uh, to be required. I, I, I fully agree in that perspective. Sorry, Niels. 
Um, therefore, I, I mentioned one of the examples that you can do and think completely thinking about trade finance. I think you want to do financing trade. That's what we have to do for the transformation. And now we have instruments, especially if you think about the documentary world, which are really depending on these documents. Uh, supply chain finance is more looking in the triggers coming from the logistics uh, environment. And with all this new uh, technology together with IoT, you, you can get more information and different trigger points. So you have to think about what is the client really interested in to choose a certain financing instrument. They want to have more control over the goods. They want to have security about payment. So what can you use information which is currently in a digital form where you feel like you're confident with and you still have uh, uh, enough risk mitigation, so to say, that you still can provide another type of means of financing then depending on what we already do for the last 200 years. I think that is also the mindset and the transformation we as a financial institution, as an example, should also go into. Yeah, yeah. It's great that you bring up supply chain finance and that's that's one area of trade finance which, which uh, is uh, highly digitized today. And, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and much of it actually happens on fully digitized basis. And, and that's possible because the financiers are looking at just one piece of information for their financing decision, which is uh, the receivables yeah. or the payables, right? Or, or, or the invoice information. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's a shift in, uh, in mindset as well, that's it. Thanks for, for your insights, that's in always appreciate. Uh, there was, uh, was Niels again who wanted to... Thanks, yeah. I'm, I'm using the Zoom, uh, Zoom functions. <clears throat> but um, but um, yeah, no, I, I just wanted to say that, uh, that, that it's, it's true that, you know, that the Seaway Bill and the Airway Bill, they're, yeah, they're indeed uh, documents that are, that are used. But the difference between, between the two is that um, the bill of lading, I think it's particularly focused on because it's a, uh, it's a document of title, which means that if you have that document, if you can claim possession, um, that means that, uh, that you have the right to the goods. Uh, whereas I think in, in the way bills, you just need to prove that you are the person listed in, in the way bill. Um, so I think that's why I think the bill of lading is focused on. Um, so you could say that I think digitizing the the Seaway bill uh, and and that would be good for you know for data, which which I think is, is probably a valuable proposition as well. Um, but it it doesn't you know it it's not capable of acting as um, for example collateral to uh, to letters of credit, um, which is also a significant area of I think digitalization or where where that could definitely become a a positive process. Um, <clears throat> so actually. Um, yeah, Bob. I mean, you work for ABN Amro. Do you do you know anything about the uh, the, the letters of credit um, process and how how blockchain could could maybe make that more more efficient? Oh yeah, there are many uh, 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 platforms working on that. One of them, example, is Contour, which actually is a blockchain solution. Uh, it's a bank consortium officially where it started with, uh, and they're focusing really on uh, digitization, the letter of credit. And the process on it. Okay, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, um, yeah, you, you'd think that with with smart contracts, you'd be able to kind of digitize the whole, uh, you know, proof that you have whatever enough enough balance in your in your bank account. Uh, um, so yeah, maybe maybe an interesting uh, point of further discussion at some point. Yeah, and an, another example which is more focusing currently still on the commodity trade finance is Congo is another uh, platform which uh, provides the services related to finance. And I think uh, the, the more traditional uh, trade finance uh, vendors are looking also more in the technology uh, and use that in their solutions. Okay. I, I think I um, see uh, Joel Schrevens from uh, uh, China Systems, for instance, giving an example. This is Joel. Joel. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for mentioning my name, Bob. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I just it's it's an interesting it's an interesting. Uh, I, I like the webinar a lot. It gives me a bit more detailed insight in the logistics and in, in sort of what happens on the physical supply chain. But uh, there is indeed, I think, a, a challenge. Actually, the biggest challenge is connecting the dots. Yeah, that's what we ultimately want to do. A business case is a connecting existing dots. 
and uh, and there are many dots and uh, i think we are we are picking out some of them and 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 one of them i just put a link there normally i'm not that marketing oriented but i said uh, yeah I'll, I'll put it in anyway for those people who are interested we are we are working on a development right now to to bring two dots together and and the EBL as a document of title is, is a key one. Uh, and, and we're trying to solve actually the fundamental challenge in trade. Uh, supplier wants to make sure he gets paid. The buyer wants to make sure he gets delivered what he ordered. That was trade is about. And how can you bring those two requirements together in the most simple way? So how can you combine a financial commitment and a, uh, a, a physical commitment in terms of delivering goods together. And we, we are, we, we, we've created, we, we're developing a business case where we can do that in full digital fashion. So instead of being dependent on a physical delivery of documents, we're doing a full digital quid pro quo, uh, an acceptance of a digital bill of exchange uh, against a digital transfer of ownership of uh, a two order bill of lading. And so we're working with two uh, EBL providers. I think they are on this call. I've seen Bolero and I've seen Cargo X. Uh, they're gonna help us uh, on the transfer of ownership of the document. And we're working with an EGO to actually handle the financial aspect to, to actually create a digital acceptance of a bill of exchange. And we're doing that in a full digital fashion. So not to be dependent on any physical delivery. Uh, so uh, that's something we're currently working on. This article sort of describes that because it's like I said, there's many business cases, but this is one ultimately like Tatine also explained, we are mainly looking at it from a financial point of view. How can we sort of inject trade finance into logistical processes and there you have to sort of connect the dots and we've picked out two and uh the good thing about and that's where eugenio uh, also uh, the remarks are relevant the good thing about on, on on the financial side that the technology we're using is complied with model on electronic transferable records uh, which is gradually being adopted uh, adgm Abu Dhabi just adopted it as well. And as Tatini also correctly described, you do not have to be physically located in a certain jurisdiction to adopt the law. So what could, what could happen is that some organizations may decide to start issuing certain instruments subject to legislation of a certain jurisdiction. So you can do transactions uh, subject to certain law, you can adopt ADGM law, which 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 aims to go for MLETR compliance, uh, without actually being physically located there. Uh, so I think there's going to be we're at the start of this. Yeah, there's still many hurdles. I don't want to simplify it because it is not simple, but we have to. It's our job as solution providers to actually show the way, even though there's today still legal challenges. But if we do not put the creativity to show what we can do. Yes, we are not the ones we will be, China systems will not be the ones crossing the legal hurdles. It's not gonna be us. It's gonna be the issuers of those documents and the, the process of those transactions. But we, we're not going to wait until the gates will fully open. We have to also, it's our duty to also start showing where dots can be efficiently connected and where we can collaboratively establish workflows between different participants of a trade flow. That's our job. Absolutely, and I think Joel, you, you mentioned a very nice example of connecting the dots, collaborating with many different players in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And although it's just still just a few, um, yeah. it's a start, you have to do something and hopefully we are able to connect all of the dots together and yeah. then we find out that a blockchain or DFT is actually the utility in order to achieve that. Yeah, I agree. But we have to start with a really realistic business case, uh, you know, something where we can say, look, it works because it could, it could, you could do slides on, on a thousand things, but we really, we only pick up things that we can demonstrate and demonstrate them pretty quickly. And that's exactly. one of the cases 
this. We've called it the EPU, which is an electronic payment undertaking, which is also similar to PAFT's DLPC, Distributed Ledger Payment Commitment. But then from an IDFAS point of view, it's the legal instrument development in partnership with Sullivan Partners, uh, which aims to replace sort of, well, provide an equivalent, a digital equivalent of a promissory note and a bit of a change, but in a digital format. So that's where we're using an ego. And on the EDL side, we work with any partner, actually. We, we're not exclusive, you know, we, but we work with partners that want to move quickly because on the EBL side, I expect at some point where you have rule books, and that's related to what Neil said, there is still a hurdle. If, you, if you're a big company, there's about six, seven EBL providers today. What I expect is an IATA with the e-airway bill has achieved something, you know, it has moved to a multilateral level. The same thing will have to be done, is going to happen with EBLs. The agreements will have to move to a level above the closed ecosystems. But of course, today I understand the EBL providers, you cannot wait till that happens. They have to meet business requirements today. However, in the future, it would make sense that the rule book shifts to a higher level. That, that you actually, that agreements can be established uh, for participants to trade documents at a higher level, not at as long as I, digital identity is not 100% portable across ecosystems, something will need to be established at a higher level. But that's a matter of time. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Joe, for the problem, Andrea. You forced me. <laughs> what? Yeah. yeah, you forced me to say something. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Andrea. No, no, no. No worries. I think we're running out of time, uh, actually, uh, now, Joel. Mm -hmm. Julian, you want something to the discussion from your side as well? Julian, are you there? I'm there. No, I think that was an excellent talk. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, everybody. I think that was a... I think we've run out of time, but that was a... I think we need more of this. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so I'd love to thank Bob uh, for this for this very interesting meeting. And you know, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, actually thank you for everybody afterwards uh, for this fantastic uh, discussion we have. Uh, and uh, what you mentioned before by Julian, should it is much more. It's uh, important to move forward. Perfect. Uh, I'll wait for you all for the next meeting in a week's time and see you soon. Thanks for, for being here. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. Thank take you. care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.